Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's talk about data and how, how are we going to get data. Yes, we are going to do these projects in the next days and I guess most of them will need some data. Um, and how are we going to do that? And so what I'm going to show you now in, the, in this short talk is just how to get data using some example of a website that we developed here in Koblenz, which is called Connect. Um, the Koblenz network collection, and I'm, I'm going to show, show you that. But um, just to, to give you some uh, perspective, some historical perspective, if we go back several decades and we look at how did people do some, how did people look at social networks maybe, let's say, 30 years ago, something like that, um, and you, can, you can read some books from that time and you will find these kind of tables in it. So this is, um, so, so what happened here is someone some social scientists just went to a company and, or went to several companies and just interviewed the CEOs and just asked them, who are you doing business with or who are your best colleagues, who do you trust, who you distrust, and so on. So they just made these interviews personally with everyone and as a result, they just assembled these types of tables. So this is a social network. Uh, but of course, it's, it's very hard to see what is going on, right? But it's still, it's still a quite small network and you you can go out there into the companies and just, just ask people questions and get, a, get this data from it. Yeah, but on the internet, obviously, this is not going to work, so I'm not going to ask each of you who are your, your best five Facebook friends and draw a picture from that or a table. This is not how it's going to work. We need to get the data in some other way. Yeah, but uh, in, in the past, this, this is what, uh, how, it, uh, how it worked, yeah? Um, now let's look at so, some newer work on analyzing online social networks. So if you just look at, for instance, uh, the World Wide Web Conference, so the WWW Conference from two years ago. So these are the four papers from this conference that were uh, nominated for the Best Paper Award. And I just looked into here how many different data sets did these papers even use data sets? And if yes, if yes, how many? And so one of the paper was using one data set. Uh, one was using three, one was using four, one was using five. Um, and now the question is, um, yeah, who won the best paper award here? And who was it? Can you guess which paper won the best paper award? Well, actually, it was, it was that paper, which has five data sets. Yeah? So, and of course, this is just a little anecdote. But having data sets, and having good data sets, and even having multiple data sets is a good thing when you're doing research in web science or in, in online uh, social media. Yeah? And, and there, are, there are good reasons to use, to use all these, uh, these data sets. So one reason is you could, have, uh, you could analyze several different application areas. So yeah, maybe you are looking at one uh, social network of people who are gaming online together, but at the same time you maybe also want to look at people who are doing something serious online, yeah? And maybe you will get more insight by comparing them and not just having one data set. Yeah, maybe you want to generalize your results. So if you're working on a link prediction or a recommender system, uh, maybe you want to prove in your study that your recommender system works on, on different types of data on different types of communities. Yeah? Maybe you want to make your, your results statistically significant. So what does that mean? Um, let's say I'm writing a paper and I'm inventing a new algorithm. And now I'm using the word algorithm in the sense that computer scientists are using. So I really develop a new, new algorithm. Uh, let's call it X. And I want to prove that it's better than the baseline algorithm used in that area, which I'm going to call Y. And so what I'm going to do well, I just uh, get me some data set, data set A. I apply both, uh, both algorithms to the data set A, and if my algorithm is good, then I'm going to find that X has a higher precision than Y on this data set A. Yeah, so X works better, gets better result on this one data set, and then that's nice, so I can write my paper, I can say, okay, X works better, performs better than algorithm Y. That's my paper, I can publish it. But is this really a good paper? Now, I wrote a paper, based on one data set. Well, what is if I use another data set B? Yeah, uh, let's try out these two algorithms on data set B, and it could be that, oh, yeah, data set, uh, data set B, on data set B, it's algorithm Y that performs better. Yeah, so that, I didn't expect that, but my, my paper is already published, and it already says, yeah, my algorithm is the best. So, so what does it mean? It means having more data set is good because you can 
not all data sets are the same. So even if you have two data sets, both from something very similar, so you could look at two online gaming communities from some, even some games with similar dynamics, and still these communities could behave in a different way. And as a result, different recommender system will be better for, for these two algorithms. So the question is now, okay, I could use two data sets. Um, and let's imagine that I, 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 maybe I can take even more than two. I could use, let's say I have 10 data sets from 10 different communities, and I found out my algorithm X works better than w algorithm Y in six out of 10 uh, cases. Yeah, so in six, for six of these data sets, my algorithm is better. For four of these data sets, the baseline is better. What, uh, what can I say? Can I conclude something? So I can say, okay, um, what is, I'm going to do a statistical test. So I'm going to say, I want to show that my algorithm X is better, so I'm going to define my null hypothesis, and my null hypothesis is just that X and Y perform equally well, yeah? And under that null hypothesis, what is the probability that I'm going to get the result as extreme as I get? So this is a, just a simple statistical test, and the result is 17%, yeah? So in 17% of cases, I'm going to get this result six out of 10 by chance, yeah? So this is not, this is such a high number that this is, can happen by chance. So just seeing my algorithm perform better than the baseline in six out of 10 times, that's not really statistically significant. And in fact, uh, so usually what you want to have is uh, you're going to, to take a threshold, for instance, of 0 0.05, so that's a p-value. And if, if your p-value is under that threshold, then you can say, yes, my algorithm is better than the other, yeah? And given that uh, my algorithm performs better in 60% of the cases, uh, you would need 65 data sets in your study to show that, uh, to get the statistical significance, yeah? So just for the 60%, if you get the value higher than 60%, you need less data sets, yeah? So if, you have a, if your algorithm is really, really better, like let's say in 95% of the cases, you need much less data sets to show that, but in most of the cases, the algorithm that you have, your new algorithm is going to be just a little bit better, yeah? So the, the conclusion that I want to say from this is just, um, in general, if you do a study on one data set, you can have a conclusion about this one community, about this one case, but if you want to generalize this, you need more data set, yeah? And this is just an example of how we did this study for, in the case of link prediction, and we tried this out on several data sets, and here we computed, actually, the p-value, yeah, and this p-value, we, we uh, colored it, we put it in a color uh, that's different from white when it was smaller than this threshold of 0 0.05. Yeah, so this was just to, to compare these five different algorithms. Yeah, um, and now, uh, so this is one, one advantage of having many different data sets. But there are also other cases. So for instance, um, we can go on and verify uh, things that are taken for granted sometimes. So for instance, um, one thing that we always hear all the time is, yes, uh, social networks have a high clustering coefficient. So what it means, high clustering coefficient in the social network, it means uh, two of my friends are more likely to be friends with each other than two random uh, people taken out of the population. Yeah? So if two people have a common friend, it's more likely that they are friends with each other than two, two random strangers. Yeah, so this is something that has been analyzed many, many times and found to be true in many different cases under many different aspects. And uh, can we verify that it is true using some, some social networks that we have? Yeah. Um, so for instance, we could ask the question, is, uh, do, uh, do social networks have a higher clustering coefficients than other types of networks? So for instance, than the web, yeah, than hyperlink networks. And how can we answer these types of questions? Uh, so what we can do here is, now what is, that's it, now we have a little bit of a problem. Uli, are all pictures like this? So if all pictures are like this, then it's not going to be a nice talk. Um, no, seriously. So I, what is this? So let me just continue. I think it's not all pictures are going to be like this. I guess this is the case because that's an EPS file for some reason. So just what you don't see here, but I can tell you the result, is just that what we analyzed is here, we took several social networks that we extracted here in Koblenz, several hyperlink networks from the web, 
And what we found out is that indeed social networks have a higher clustering coefficients than hyperlink networks, but here this is the thing you don't see. Yeah? So, so, um, so that's that. And this you, you would have seen it here as two nice curves. Okay? So you will have to believe me or ask me, ask me for this afterward. I have it on my laptop. Yeah? Yeah, but I prefer to have the, the preview. So I think, we, I think I have just a few of these plots. So I think it's just that and actually this. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> the next one. <laughs> Wait. This is not nice. OK, but you know what? What we're going to do, we're going to skip these few slides. Later on, I have other pictures, which are PNGs. And if they don't work, we go to the PDF file, OK? But I guess they will work. So we also, also for reasons of time, because I plan with a little bit more time. But these are all examples of what you can do when you have many data sets. Yeah? So you can look at uh, different statistics and, and so on and so on. And you can also try to generate random graphs and see do they correspond to the actual networks that we have and get some, some results that you see here. Okay? Uh, but now what we actually want to get at. So these were just examples that now you didn't see, but these were examples of things you can do when you have lots of data. But now the question is, where does the data come from? Yeah? So we in Koblenz now, we crawled lots of different data. We, get, we acquired lots of different data sets from social networks, from hyperlink networks, and so on, uh, from different sources. Um, I guess, um, who here has already crawled or acquired a data set from, from the web so in, in any form? Yeah? Either a simple crawl or maybe yeah, so quite a few of you have already crawled there. Who has crawled several, who has acquired several different data sets? Yeah, so how, how many have you? Can, can you give me some numbers? Just ballpark. Three. Three or something. Yeah, crawl it. So, it, you can, so there are different ways you can get data. You can crawl it, which usually is quite complex. You have to write a crawler. You will get problem with being throttled. The, the format of the website can change, and so on and so on. You can make your life simple by downloading the table from some websites. So for instance, there's this website called prosper.com. They have, just give you the table. It's, it's a website for lending money to other people. And so this website, they give you a table with all the information. You get the whole data set, who has lent money to whom. And so you can get one table, and that's very easy to pass. Yeah, so, but whatever you do, um, usually in most studies, you will see people using just a single data set, simply because each data set has a different format. Yeah? So if you want to have three or four or five data sets, even from the same application domain in your data set, um, you will have to crawl five different formats. You will have to download five different files. You will have to write five different Python scripts or Perl scripts or whatever you are writing in that transform each of these different forms into a, a one same format that you, then you can use. Yeah? So this is a quite a hard thing. So it's a good, it would be a good idea to have this data set available in one common format, right? And uh, one, one thing that has been emerging in the, in the recent years is something that's called uh, web observatories. Yeah, so this is, um, so what I, th I think Steffen mentioned what a web observatory is, but it's, it's a good idea to, to think a little bit uh, more about what a web observatory is. So, so we heard this morning uh, this, this, this comparison that computer science is, is um, as much about computers than astronomy about telescopes. Yeah, and of course it's right, astronomy is not about classifying telescopes, anything like that. But still you need telescopes to do astronomy, right? So telescopes are really important for astronomy, or any experimental setup is important for physics, and so on and so on. And the same is true if you're doing web science. Um, you need to observe the web in order to do science about the web, right? So you need some form of way to observe the web. So either you can do it yourself, and for every new, new website or for every new community that you observe, you would have to, to have a different, different crawl or a different software that crawls it. Or the idea here is to have web observatories which do that for you and which do it in a unified format in unified ways. Yeah? So that's the idea. And in fact, so these web observatories, this is something, I think the initiative came from, from, this, uh, from the Web Science Trust. And actually, you can go on, 
on this website from them. Uh, you can just look at different uh, web observatories that they have collected. And this is a very uh, un incomplete list. Yeah? So there are many more websites out there which collect many data sets. So we have, we have Koblenz also in there. This is, this is our network collection. And you have many more things, but there are, there are many more of them. Yeah? So this is, this is just a small glimpse of uh, websites collecting data sets from the web, making them available in some standardized format. Yeah, and of course, data sets can have many different, there can be many different types of data sets. You could have collections of text, you could have a social network, you could have a, a, just a web crawl, yeah, why not? You could have many different things, but there's one uh, topic or one, uh, one aspect of data sets used in web science which is quite, it's not ubiquitous, so it's not every data set falls into that category, but still it's very widespread and that's the network. Yeah? So many data sets that we use are actually networks. And uh, so, so for instance, social networks are just, yeah, by, even, it even contains the word network. Uh, the web itself, the set of pages and hyperlink that forms a network, obviously. Uh, you can look at communication between people. That would be a network. You can look at trust. Trust is a network between entities, for instance, people or, or companies or, or whatever. You can have interaction between whatever, again, interaction between people or interaction between something else. You could have traces of people. How, how do people move, either in the real world, going from A to B to C? So if you are using Foursquare, uh, you are leaving these traces that someone's going to collect and having a data set out of it. You could have traces online when you visit websites. You have the refer. Every, every website tracks which pages you are visiting. There are many web trackers, so Google Analytics, for instance, other web trackers which are just embedded on websites and which track where you go even across many different websites. They have a data set which essentially is a network that you're going from A to B to C and so on. So all these are data sets which by their structures are networks. And this is not, not all data sets are like this, but many of them are. And, and therefore, it's also clear that there are, uh, there are quite a lot of websites which give you data sets that you can use in web science that are specialized for networks. Yeah? So one of them is the Koblenz Network Collection, so Connect, so I already mentioned it. There's one called SNAP, which is a Stanford Network Analysis Project. So that's, I think it's, that's the oldest one of these three. Um, then there's something which is very recent called the Index of Complex Networks. So that's called ICON. That's from University of Colorado. Uh, and so they, these are the big three, I would say. Yeah, and, but there are also many smaller ones which either specialize in some aspects of networks or, uh, or just have uh, less networks. Yeah? And so what, what, are the, what does a web observatory contain? Yeah, so the main aspect, what does a web observatory contain? Uh, primarily, a web observatory just what does it contain? It just contains data sets and makes them available, right? So that's the that's the obvious answer to that question. So this would be, and now using the example of Connect, which is kind of a typical web observatory, you have uh, some data sets here. Yeah. So Connect, we have something about 250 data sets, which are network data sets. We make them available, but this is not all what a web observatory contains. Yeah? So what is the, what's the most basic thing we need? First of all, before we even build a web observatory, we need to define what are we going to have and what's, what kind of different, in this, guy, this case, what kind of different networks are we go even going to have? Yes, yeah? so we need some kind of ontology that tells us what is exactly the structure. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but we also need more. We need some kind of, uh, we need some, some kind of part of the system that is able to get the data. Yeah, so we need to be able to transform different types of data formats into another. This is quite trivial, but it has to be done because, of course, people are using many different um, network formats. So you also need some crawlers to go into the web to read the data. Uh, and of course, so if you just have this, if you just have the data and everything that you need to get the data, you could call this a web observatory, but most web observatories give you more. Yeah? So what, what could web observatories give you more? Web observatories can analyze the data already and give you some analyses. So for instance, that's something we do in Connect. Yeah? So in Connect, we actually analyze all these networks we have and give you some insight uh, into these networks. So we, we give you, we, 
perform some analysis. I'm going to show a few examples of them later. And also, in order to analyze these, we actually have code that does that. And this is what we call our toolbox. And this toolbox is available. And most of these, most other web observatories also make available their code. So you can just get their code and do the analysis yourself on the data you have yourself. Yeah? And, and finally, of course, we have a website where we present everything. And this can be very useful. So what can you do on the website? You can just download the data. But you can also do other things. So for instance, uh, what if you are searching for a data set? Yeah, you don't, maybe you have a certain question you want to answer, some web science question. And you don't even know which data set you're going to use to answer that question. Then the, the question becomes, OK, which data set am I going to use? And that may be a non-trivial question, given that data set may have many different properties. Yeah? And, and so the idea is that you can build into your, your web observatory some kind of search engine which will find the data sets for the task at hand. Yeah? But now let's look a little bit um, at the complexity of the data. So we said we need some kind of ontology. So not all data sets are the same. Yeah? Now I'm going to talk about the networks that we have in Connect, but this also applies to other kind of data sets. So for instance, if you would look at text data sets, you could, you, could, um, you could have a similar list like this, which gives you the variety in the data that you have. So for instance, if we look at networks, we can ask, is it directed or undirected? Yeah, so um, if I'm a friend with you, will or you also be a friend with mine, which is the case on Facebook? Or is it more like Twitter that I can follow you, but you don't follow me? Yeah. Um, is the data, is the network unipartite or bipartite? Yeah. So uh, most ne we think of a network like a, a social network, just nodes connected, uh, nodes connected by links. But in most cases, actually, networks are bipartite. So maybe people watch movies. Yeah. So there are many networks about who has seen which movie, or maybe who has rated which movie. And that's actually also a network, people connected to movies. But this has a special structure because people are only connected to movies, and movies are only connected to people. There are no links between people. There are no links between movies. So this network has a special structure, which is called bipartite. Yeah? Maybe we have uh, so, some special uh, value stored with the edges, some ratings for movie rating, maybe on a 1 to 5 scale. Maybe we have something such as a social network where you cannot only like someone, but you can also dislike someone. Yeah, then we would have a signed network with positive and negative edges. We can have information like, does, this, the, does the network allow multiple edges or not? Does it have loops? Do we have metadata like timestamps? And so on and so on. Yeah? So all these are different kinds of information that have to be modeled by the system. So any web observer will need an ontology or some, some semantics in order to, to represent all this information. And we can even go further. We can say, for instance, what is the size of the data set? Yeah, what is the clustering coefficient? What is the diameter of your network? And this too has to be represented using some ontology. Yeah, so any web um, observatory will need to have an ontology for it which can represent all these things. Yeah? And now um, for the examples of network, I think I mentioned this, so I'm not going to go into the details here, but this is for, for our Connect, for our Koblenz network data set. These are the different types of, uh, we call it formats, that a data set can have, so unipartite, directed, or bipartite. Uh, the same is true for the different types of edges we can have. Yeah, so here we have a, a few more types of edges. And every network, every data set in our collection is of exactly one of those types. Yeah? And so if you need a data set, you can really go to our website and search exactly for a data set of exactly one of those types if you need exactly one of those types. Yeah? Uh, but now we can, we can uh, go a little bit further and say, OK, what is the ideal case of a web observatory? We have some data sets from some source. We put them into the web observatory. Researcher, as a researcher, we come, we take the data, we make our research, and that's all just perfect. But in general case, we will have some, some more problem, which is that the data is not really, the data is not perfect. Yeah? So there can be many issues with the data. The data could be completely wrong. Yeah, so I've, I've seen data sets which are wrong, such as, for instance, uh, a network which was posted somewhere on a website. It said it was a directed network. But just by looking at the structure of this directed network, we could infer that it was actually an undirected network. Or maybe it was directed, but the, e the edge directions were just lost in the process somewhere. And so um, that a, a network can be completely 
wrongly labeled, but there, there can be some, some, some other types of problems. So one very common problem is that almost all networks are not complete. Yeah, so if you crawl, you're not going to crawl Facebook, but maybe, maybe you crawl so some websites and you get as much data from the site as you can. Um, this, you can do that, but you're never going to have the full website, right? So this is, having a full website by crawling is almost impossible, yeah? So even if the, the website is completely connected, so even if they're just following links, you can arrive everywhere, even then it's likely that, the, for instance, the website can change over time, and then once you have crawled it, you miss the first part. But the problem is that when you finish crawling, you get another part of the site uh, crawled at a different time than the first part of the site. Yeah? So you, just, just by the fact that your crawling is not, uh, does not happen in one second, you will have so, some kind of problem. And it can also be that maybe you have just a, a subset of the data. Maybe some other researcher who made this data set available said, oh no, this data set is too big. I'm going to sample it. I'm going just to take a random subset of it. Yeah, this is something that happens quite often. If, you're, if the method that you are applying to your data set does not scale to the size of your data set, but you still want to write your paper, what do you do? Well, you just take a subset of your data and apply it to that. Yeah, so it doesn't sound really right to do this, but it's still very common because otherwise you cannot apply your method. Yeah, so as a result, you're going to get just a subset of this data. Yeah, in the best case, this subset is completely randomly chosen. And if that is the case, and if you know that this is what happened, then you can infer properties about the original data set from your sampled data set. Yeah, but in most cases, often you don't even know that it was sampled, let alone what was the exact sampling rate, and you also don't know whether the sampling was even uh, random or maybe the sampling was biased, yeah? Maybe some nodes were more likely to be included in your data set and more other nodes were more likely to be, to be deleted for, for whatever reason. Yeah, it may just be a simple reason that your crawler had a bug and uh, just rejected some sites or didn't save some pages for some technical reason with a certain probability and then you just have a sample without even wanting that, yeah? Another problem that happens quite a lot is so-called a K-core. Yeah, so the, what is the K-core of a network? It just means that we filter out everything, every, uh, we filter out all nodes that don't have a certain minimal number of connections. Yeah, so that's called the K-core. So for instance, if you would take this network, you take the so-called three-core, yeah, for K-core three, you keep only nodes that have three neighbors, you get this. Yeah, so you get just a very small amount um, of content from your actual uh, data set. Now, of course, this data set will be very biased. So what is an example where this happens? So for instance, if you look at movie rating data sets, many of them just exclude movies that are very rare, that are almost never rated, yeah? And also many data sets exclude people who have not given enough ratings. So I remember one data set, I think Movie Lens, just has uh, users who have rated at least, I think, 20 movies or something like that. Yeah, so just removing users who have rated uh, not, not enough movies, this changes the dynamics of, of your data set completely, yeah? So if you want to make a study seeing, I don't know, how many movies have people seen in common, something like this, this is going to change completely if you only include people who have seen many movies, yeah, as opposed to people who have seen just a few movies. So just doing this K-core can completely change your result. Uh, another problem that happens very often is so-called, uh, when you make a so-called join, yeah? So in, who, who knows what a database join is? Just da data, yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just to, so I, let, let me explain what it is without uh, talking about databases. So the idea is, for instance, imagine, um, imagine that you have, you have researchers writing papers, yeah? And you collect that as a network, so on the left side, you have the researchers, yeah, the persons, and on the right side you have papers they have written. This is your original data set, it is clean, it is nice. This is what you would like to have as a data set. But now, what happens very often is that the source where you get your data, they don't give you this whole data set. Instead, what they give you is which researchers have written a paper together, yeah? So this would be the co-authorship network, yeah? So for instance, these two uh, scientists, they have written one, way, uh, one paper together, so they are connected in this data set. 
Yeah, so the, this would be called the join in, in the speech, uh, in, in the language of databases. Yeah, and so the result is you have your network, it's still a network and you can use it, but it still behaves very differently from the original network. Yeah, so here there will be the number of edges will be very, uh, very biased. So for instance, if you have a paper with seven authors, all pairs of these authors are going to be connected. So your network here is going to contain many, many clicks. Yeah? So many, many groups of people who are all connected with each other just because there was one single paper with many authors. And this is something that you would not have if you, just, if you would just look at the normal social network. Imagine if you have uh, some research group consisting of seven people. Uh, will all of them be connected? Will all pairs be connected on Facebook? Maybe most pairs will be connected, but not all, yeah? But just if you look at this join, automatically, just by construction, you will have a data set where everyone in this group of seven is connected with everyone, yeah? So this is going to, to bias the data set that you have, and so on and so on, yeah? Uh, so that's that. And now, uh, we can say, okay, we, we have all these things, but still, we want, you want to go out and choose a data set, right? So you can go to, to the website of the web observatory and you will see a list of data sets. So this, as I said, this is the example from, from the Connect project. These are all networks, but it would work the same way with other types of data sets, yeah? And the idea here is that you see not only the names of the data set, but you see also other information about it. So for instance, what we call the category, which means what kind of data is represented by the network. So for instance, a social network or a, uh, I don't know, an infrastructure network like a road network, uh, maybe a rating network, user movie rating, for instance, co-authorship network, authorship network, and so on and so on. Yeah, so these are the different types of categories that are represented and every data set has this semantics coded with it. Yeah, here you see the format. These are unipartite, bipartite, or directed. You see the weight of the edges, all the different types from the table we saw earlier. And you have all the different types of metadata. So for instance, this would mean the data set is allowed to contain loops. Yeah, so loop would be an edge connected to, to yourself. Yeah? So if, if you can be your own friend or if you can follow yourself on a social network, then it would allow loops. Otherwise, it will not. So on Twitter, for instance, there are no loops. You cannot follow yourself. Yeah, the same is true for, we have the timestamps as metadata and so on and so on. Yeah, and of course, one, one of the important uh, characteristics here is the size of the network. So what you can do is, so if you do it here, you can just click on this N, which is the number of nodes in the network, or you can click on the M, which is the number of edges in the network, and it will sort the table. So if you say, for instance, um, I want to use a social network which has at least a million edges, you can just click on this M and just choose one of the data set. So just to give you an idea of the different sizes we have here. So the largest network we have is a social network. It's from Friendster and it contains 2.5 billion edges yeah, and 68 uh, million users. Yeah, so this, you could use that, that's very large. So it's likely if you have some advanced method or some, if you're doing some machine learning, some data mining with it, it's likely that it's going to be very slow on this data set. So if you just want to try out your method, it would be a good idea to just go down on this table and to choose. This is the table goes on here, yeah? So you would go down on this table and choose a small data set to start with. Later on, you can go take a bigger one and then test your, your method by the bigger one. But what you can also say is um, maybe you want to make a study which needs a certain network which has some other special property. So maybe you want to have a network which has a particularly high diameter, yeah? So you can just go on this page where we computed the diameter, yeah? So what is the longest path in this network? And you, it, it gives you all, all these data sets um, sorted by diameter. So the, the highest diameter, that's for, for road networks. Yeah? So the road network of Texas. So if you're one corner of Texas, you want to go to the, to the other corner of Texas, you need to, to follow many individual roads to go through many different intersections, like over 1,000, yeah? So that's the diameter is 1,000, uh, what is it, 64. Yeah, um, and in fact, you can do the same for many different types of network statistics, which of course, in the case of Connect, is specific uh, to networks. You can also uh, not only look at numbers, but look at uh, plots. Yeah, look at, at certain graphs associated with the data set. So, for instance, these are degree distributions. I'm not going to explain what a degree, who, who doesn't know what a degree distribution of a network is. 
Yeah, so I guess most of you know what it is. That's good. Yeah, so, um, and of course, you probably have heard then networks are scale free. Networks have power law degree distribution. That's depending on how strict you interpret that sentence, it is true or not true for most data sets. So, in a strict sense, it's not true, but uh, you have data sets where it is true to quite an extent. Yeah, so visually, it looks like it, but for other data sets, you have very very weird things going on, yeah? And of course, you, you can explain these for different reasons, but if you're looking for a data set that has a spare certain property, you, can, you could go there, look at that property, and this is also true for other types of plots you can do for networks. So all of these analyses, all of these plots we have are network specific, and so this is something that happens if you collect data sets, if you have a web observatory or any type of observatory, um, the more specific your data is, for instance, networks here, the more specific analyses you can do. Yeah? So for Connect, we are able to do all this. If you can collect, if you have a network which just collects information about data sets in general, it will not have all this data. Yeah? So that's the reason why many web observatories are quite specific in what they collect. They don't collect just any data set, but for instance, only networks or only text, maybe only something else. Yeah, and uh, then um, let's so so then I have, I have a slide or two about how to how to read these files, but I'm just going to skip them. This is not so hard; it's also well documented, so you don't need that. Um, yeah, and now uh, for the last slide, um, just well at some point once you have your data set, you have chosen your data set, you can finally do your work. I'm not going to tell you how to do your work, so I guess you will use a programming language to do it, probably some numerical uh, computing programming language, and that's the end of my talk, so thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Um, so the Web Science Trust knows about Connect, uh, has it on their website, and we actually use uh, semantic technologies to advertise Connect as a dataset collection. Which is so. If you um, so you remember the slide I had with the screenshot from from the web page from the Web Science Trust where they list all the repositories of data of network data or other datasets. This is actually based on semantic data, which is in these websites. So we have just in the HTML, we have this, this semantic information. So they know about it. And of, I guess also the, the persons there are likely to have heard of it, if that was the question. So the Well, it's, it's more than a web page. It's, uh, it's an organization that, uh, how to describe it better, uh, Stefan, maybe you want to say a word or two about the Web Science Trust. Um, about the, the Web Observatory? Oh. Or, so, so. Sorry, this is a little last question. Uh, the Web Science Trust case, so we saw the Web Science Trust as one of their partners. Yeah. So it's just a case that you know about the. Yeah, so uh, the Web Observatory here is basically a kind of inventory of other Web Observatories. So the idea is not to have one central authority, so that would also be nice, uh, but rather to have an inventory of what other web observatories are around. And if any of you has a particular nice collection of data sets relevant to the web scientist, uh, the idea is to have to annotate it in SQL.org and send a link to the people who maintain that list. Yours is added. That's, that's the idea. Rather than have to have an inventory. I mean, we also tried at some point to uh, apply for money to do it in a more structured way than it is now. We weren't successful yet, but that's the usual game of like applying for funds and then sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. And uh, we keep on moving, but let's see. Other questions? Yes. Are there any non-network? Not in Connect. So 
Yes, so the question was whether these are all network data sets. Um, so in Connect, we have, so by definition, we have only network data sets. Um, so one aspect of networks is that many things which at first glance don't look like networks can be modeled as a network. So for instance, even text, you can see if you have a corpus of text documents, you can extract from it the bipartite network which tells you which document contains which word. So these are just uh, text networks, and we have those also in Connect, but of course you lose the ordering of the words. Basically, you just get the bag of words from, from it. Um, what we have is we have some metadata, which is, uh, can go back to the, no, nah, can I go back? Yes. Uh, I don't know if I have to go back. So on, on this list, if you go on the website, here we have this list. These networks which have this little icon, ah, la, la. Yeah, so there was this little icon saying one, two, three, ABC. It means we have metadata. So we have metadata about nodes. So for instance, for some social networks, we know the age of the person or the gender. Or we even have things like we crawled a website with cats and dogs, social networks. We know the, the favorite food and the favorite toy of, of the animals, stuff like this. Yeah, uh, so we try to get as much of the data as possible as long as it is a network or can be modeled as a network. That's the idea for that repository. Yeah. Oh, okay, you. <laughs> yeah. So it, it depends on the data set. So uh, you can see this also on the, trying to find the page where you, here, where is it? Uh, so the idea is that we make available the data set in an as open way as we can based on the legal constraints that we have. So most data sets are available. So whenever there is this little table-like icon, it means you can get the whole data set. Like, yeah, it's one, one big data set. Um, sometimes it's not here. So in, in this case, it's, it's here everywhere, so that's good for you. Uh, sometimes we don't have the data set, but for, I would say, three-fourths of the data set or so, we, you can download it here. I think you had a question? I'm sorry? So, so there are, I think there are two possible answers to this. So in terms of having the data being faked explicitly by someone, uh, there we, we don't check that in any form. So if, if a researcher fakes a data set, puts it online, claim, claims it comes from a certain source, we would be fooled by that totally. So you would find it online. You could find this fake data on our website. Now in terms of structural problems, we have a set of unit tests. You could call it unit tests for networks we check the plausibility of the data in several different forms so for instance it looks at the degree distribution if the degree distribution has some weird features uh, then it's going to to print out a warning or rather an error and then we find this yeah and so this is something that happens what we have also is we have these different tags uh, here so from that's an example that's a few of these tags so for instance if a network is allowed to contain loops, you have to put a tag loop on it. If you don't have the tag loop and there's still a loop in the data, it's going to make an error. You have to flag it as an error. It's, this is likely to be some, it could be some crawling problem or some, some extraction problem that your IDs are mismatched or something like this. So these are, there are many of these types of common extraction problems like interpreting a Bipartite network as a directed network, just taking the same CSV file, interpreting it wrong, giving a wrong data set. But this, these things, you can recognize them structurally by the network. Yeah. Well, this, so, what, what do you mean by integrity check? Well, if someone goes into a data set, changes a little bit, then we don't see that, except if this little bit violates some, some of the semantics. So if you insert loops in a data set that is not supposed to have loops, we're going to detect it. If you just remove some, some edges, then we're not going to detect it. And, uh, yeah, but I mean, this is a, in principle, you, how can you know that your data set is correct? So if you crawl something, 
then of course you know you, whatever you crawled was there. You may have crawling errors, just your crawler was not able to crawl a certain page and then you will have missing information. In most cases that's harmless. If, if, your data, if you get your data set as a tarball, then yes. But to be honest, uh, many of these data sets, we got them from other researchers, which crawled them themselves. And these researchers, researchers usually don't put an MD5 a hash on the website. So we'll have to trust the, the HTTP protocol or the, the wget process to just return an error. So, so in general case, uh, so we have a system in place to, to manage all these downloads and this computation of these things, um, this something called stew. And in fact, if there's an error, it will always flag this and just remove the file. So that's, but of course, if there's some, if something wanted to cheat, yeah, to edit, add some wrong things, then this is hard to detect. So for instance, you may know this Enron data set. So when, when the company Enron was, uh, when they had this scandal in the, when was it, in the year 2001, something like this. Uh, for whatever legal reason, the whole email exchange between the top uh, leaders of this company became public. I think it still is public, if I'm not mistaken. And, but some people have complained, who are in the state said some people have complained about their email being there, and they got these things removed. Yeah. So, and then, so you have a data set, we know it's incomplete because there are a few nodes missing, but that's just, for legal reason, you cannot have it uh, otherwise. Yeah. I'm sorry? So we, we don't show you the MD5 hashes. We could show you the MD5, MD5 uh, hashes. Uh, that's true, yeah. So the thing about so MD5, the thing about these hashes, the, the, the reason to have a hash is not to prevent errors in the download process. The reason is to uh, prevent someone else from distributing a file with the same name, maybe same size, but with a different content. So that's important if you download the Linux kernel source that you compile and run. You don't want this to be some, some wrong code. If you download data sets, so you could have a man in the middle attack giving you a different data set than what we have. Uh, yeah, so that would be a man in the middle attack, yeah. Yeah. That, that is true. So we don't have that. But I mean, this would uh, be easy to add, so. That's true. Yeah. I mean, one of the issues with MD5 is that things like Linux kernel or these files are by many people, they are available on many mirrors. So if you download it from some mirror, you want it to be correct so you can check the MD5 hash on the main website and download the file from, from the mirror so you can trust just, if you only trust the, the main website, that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. That's a good uh, suggestion, actually. Uh, other questions? Do I? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, just come to me if you have questions about Connect. I'm here for the poster session in the next days, too. Yeah, thank you.